Good morning again, everybody. So we're still talking in Isaiah this morning, but um, before we get there, I want to remind you of something that, a way that, that Jesus taught. We all know about parables, right? Um, and, and Jesus would tell a lot of stories and parables, and he would use those examples of things to describe one thing a lot of times. He talked a lot about what? The kingdom of God. He would say the kingdom of God is like, and then he would go into this, this description using words that people would understand um, and, and comparing the kingdom of God to something uh, that, that was easily translated by, by how he told it. We're going to see something similar a little bit here in Isaiah today. We're going to hear about these, these prophecies that Isaiah is writing to us, telling us about the kingdom of God, giving us a description of what that means. A lot of what he talks about has been referred to uh, in, in Christian terms, at least as we talk about it now, as end times prophecy. All right? You're familiar with the term the end times, right? Um, it's kind of a, a, tricky, a tricky term. And sometimes it's, it's honestly a little bit scary or, or confusing when we start talking about end times prophecy. It's a lot of it in Isaiah. There's a lot of it throughout Scripture, right? We're familiar with, like, the book of Revelation. And, and we hear about these end times prophecies and uh, if you're like me and watch the History Channel a lot, there's all these programs all the time on History Channel about how the end times are happening and, and Scripture that, that ties to it. There's a few different ways that the end times are, are defined. And we'll see throughout the, the prophecies we read today that they, they really fit into a few different categories. One way the end times can be described is how uh, Jesus first uh, came here on earth and kind of started that portion of the end times, right? He came, he was born, and that started this, this kingdom of God being here on earth and being established and, and all of that going through. That's one portion of the end times. The other one, probably the one we usually think of with the end times, is talking about Jesus' second coming. But you also have to remember who Isaiah is writing to here and who his audience is here. We've talked about the last few weeks, the exiles that were in Babylon that were coming out of Babylon and going back to Jerusalem. So to them, the end times was when that exile ended. So we really have a, a few different perspectives here as we look at these passages in Isaiah. What we want to do this morning is to kind of have all of those, uh, those questions in mind. Right? Is it this a, a first coming of Jesus prophecy? Is it a second coming of Jesus prophecy? Or is it a exile from Babylon returning to Jerusalem type of prophecy? And what we'll see, I think, a lot of times throughout Scripture is that it's all of those. We see some pretty interesting literature today as we read through the book of Isaiah, where God is able to communicate through Isaiah these prophecies that apply to the people reading it there real time, that they have a hope for deliverance, that when Jesus came, he started to fulfill part of this, and then when Jesus comes again, the rest will be fulfilled. It's a really neat piece of literature that we'll be able to read. But understand this as we go through it. It will be probably unclear at times. Here's the cool thing, though. That's okay. All right? It's all right to, to know uh, that you don't know exactly what that means, right? That, that's an okay thing. Like, so um, we're, we're building the shed on my farm, right? We're building, we got it. We're putting it up. Construction is not my forte, right? like at all. I'm not, I don't really just know a lot, that much about it. I'm figuring it out as we go. So uh, my dad, though, is one of those guys who can do anything. I, I, I don't know how he knows this stuff. He just knows that stuff. So we're putting the shed up, and he would say, okay, this is what needs to happen. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah, I, I got it, and, but I just didn't. And I, that's how I started the project. By the end of the project, he'd say, do you understand what I'm saying? I would say, no, I have no idea. I don't, I don't get that. But he would show me the way, right? He'd show me enough to get it done, and we'd move on. That's what Isaiah does for us today. You may not understand it, but it's, it's about knowing that there's a plan, right? It's about knowing that there's something there. It's about knowing that God is in control. It may not make sense to us. It may not click, uh, but it's about motivating us toward the current a place where we are in our lives. God's got it under control. God's saying these prophecies. I can't quite connect the dots on how they all work, but I do know that God has said it, and God's going to hold true to it. So understand this today. If we walk out of here confused, that's okay. That's all right. But we should walk out of here with an understanding that everything that's going on and everything that's going to happen is in God's hands, and he's, he's, got, it, he's got it under control. I think what God is really good at sometimes in our lives is giving us just a little bit of the information to motivate us for the present time, right? Like what we're going through right now. 
to motivate us to be a little bit better here, right? It's like when we go into the grocery store, I'll tell the boys if they're good, they can get something in the little aisle, checkout aisle on the way out, right? It's bribery is what it's called. That's good parenting. If I'm going to write a parenting book, it's going to be called bribery because that's how it works. That's how you get them to be good in the store, right? It's a present motivation. That's just how it works. Or, or I like this example too. Like you tell the kids to brush their teeth. Why? So they don't get cavities. You don't go into the whole description of how toothpaste works and how the, the, it cleans the teeth and protects the enamel and all those chemicals. and what they, You don't go into all that. Your example is brush your teeth or you'll get cavities, right? Simple explanation to motivate for the current situation. I think that's what the book of Isaiah is going to do for us today. We may not understand all the details behind it. We don't understand all the, the worldwide implications. But what we can do is see that God is telling us what you're going through now, what's going to happen, how things are going to take place, it all is going to make sense sometime. Right now, what we have to do is figure out how to apply it to our lives today. So we're going to do quite a bit of reading today. We're going to hop around a little bit, and we're going to read a couple of examples of these prophecies and how it applies to today, to the exiles that were coming out of Babylon, and to Jesus' first and second coming. So if you've got your, your Bible, let's turn it to Isaiah chapter 40. We'll read a few verses and a couple passages here, all kind of having the same message um, that, that is this, this picture that, that God is describing the kingdom of God and the future to us in. So chapter 40, I just want to read a couple verses there, and like I said, we're going to flip through quite a bit today, hopefully uh, for, uh, for some better understanding. So uh, starting with verse 3 of chapter 40. We've, we've heard all of these, uh, these first few before already. We'll read it again. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Okay, so keep that in mind. Turn over to chapter 42. Look down to verse 14. I've held my peace a long time. I've been still restrained my, and, and restrained myself. Now I cry like a woman in labor. I will pant and gasp at once. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will make the rivers coastlands, and I will dry up the pools. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make the darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed who trust in carved images, who say, our molded images, you are our gods. Now turn over to chapter 49. Continue this theme here with verse 8. Thus says the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth, to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be all on desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them, for he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road, and my highways shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west, and those from the lands of Sinem. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people, and he will have mercy on his afflicted. See the, the theme through there? Highway, road, paths. It has this, this image of God creating this roadway for his people. So let's think of those, those different categories this prophecy could fall in. Let's, let's talk first about the people that would have been reading this right then in Isaiah's day for current motivation. Right? Remember, they are exiled <clears throat> into Babylon out of their home country, and, and the promise has been throughout the book of Isaiah that they will be delivered, that they will return, that there will be a group of people back to Jerusalem to continue this nation, to keep God's promise going, that his people would be the people that... that got his message out, and showed the world who he was. Everybody, all nations, including the Gentiles. That was the promise. They believed it. And now they're reading this, and you can see how this would affect them, right? It says, hey, we're going to have a highway. It's going to have a path. All this is, is going to be put out of our way. God is going to lead us 
home. So as they're reading this prophecy, they're saying this absolutely applies to us right now. God's going to make mountains flat. God's going to raise up pathways. God's going to clear the path out of our way, and God will lead us home. So we see how it applies directly to the exile. That's what happened, right? God made the path, made the opportunities, got the, the way home for the, that, uh, the remnant of, to go back to Jerusalem, and they, they, uh, they got God's promises going again. So God did that in the exile. <clears throat> okay, so let's think now Jesus' first coming. That first passage we read, right? Prepare a, a way in the wilderness. We, we've heard that before, right? It's referred to somebody in the Gospels, John the Baptist. I remember, God had promised that this would happen. God is prophesying about this, and here we see that pathway happening again. John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus' message. He was out there going ahead of Jesus, starting this ministry before Jesus, talking about the Savior that was going to be coming, and then Jesus came and fulfilled those prophecies that were Old Testament prophecies and ones that John the Baptist was speaking about. He prepared the way. He was going first, and God was using John the Baptist to do as he says here in the book of Isaiah, to make the pathway possible. All right, so that happened. We've seen that. Now, the second coming of Jesus, we haven't seen it yet, but how could this apply to the second coming of Jesus? What do we see here? What's the theme throughout this? One, that God's got a plan and a path toward what his promise is. Two, that there are obstacles in the way that God will overcome. It's going to be things happen and things that, that look tricky and things that look like it's going to stop God from doing what he does. But, but as he says, he's going to make mountains flat and mountains are roads and highways will be elevated and paths will be created. And he's going to make a roadway for his promises to happen. And when it comes time, we're not going to be going on our, on our own. God's going to guide us down those pathways. So for the second coming, God's going to make all this possible. He's going to take all these obstacles out of the way. He's going to make a road that we can go down, and Jesus is going to lead us home. That's the idea here, right? Jesus is going to lead us home. The message for us, that is, as that is coming and as that is imminent and has, that hasn't happened yet, but it's on its way, we've got to prepare. Right, what's that first passage? Prepare and make a way for the Lord. We've got to prepare our hearts We've got to be ready to follow that path. We've got to know that God's going to make it. We've got to go know that God's going to work it out. We've got to know that God's going to orchestrate events in his way to remove these obstacles, make Jesus' second coming possible, and make it possible for him to lead us home. But we have to be ready to receive that. So how do we apply this today, right? Because that's, that's really what matters the most. Of all these prophecies, it's, it's neat to know, it's neat to see that, that God is going to make this, this future happen, that, that this is how the events are going to take place, that the end times have this, this set plan in place. But what really matters today as we sit here is how can we take what God has written in Scripture and apply it to our lives right now, right? Because let's, let's be real, right now is where we're living, okay? It's good to know about the future. It's good to think about the future. It's good to plan for that. It's good to try to understand it. But like I said, God has given us just enough information through his prophecies to motivate us for today. So what's he motivating us for here? I think what he's saying throughout this, these passages about highways and paths and, and ways that we need to go and, the, and the, the promise that Jesus is going to lead us home is that we have to prepare to walk down that path. We have to prepare to go on that journey. It's like, like running a marathon. Right? I, I really wish I was a runner. I do. I, I'm, I'm not at all. I'm in horrible shape currently. But here's what always happens to me when I decide I'm going to get in shape. Right? I'll go out the first day I want to get in shape, and I'll try to run like three miles. And I'll make it, and it will be miserable, and I will hate every minute of it, but I'll make it the distance I set out to make it. And then I know the next day i got to get up and run more to keep getting in shape. But you know what? My feet hurt, and my legs hurt, and my back hurts, and I'm tired, and I can't breathe, and I just don't want to get out of bed. So I don't. And then the next day, the same thing happens. And guess what? You don't ever get into that shape. The best way to get into shape is what? You want to run a marathon? Start by walking a block. The next day, walk a few blocks. The next day, run a little bit, right? And you kind of work your way up gradually there. You don't just go out today and try to run a marathon because you will fail. The same thing happens here. We've got to prepare to be able to walk down this path that God's got us for. He, he, he's showing us the way, he's giving us the path, but we've got to prepare ourselves. Why? Because it takes a lot to be led. 
There, there's a lot going on in our heads as humans, right? There are a lot of things pulling us in a lot of different directions. And it's very easy to be distracted. This world throws a lot of stuff at us, a lot of ideas, and, and a lot of philosophies. And we can try to, to take all of that and, and throw ourselves at it, and, and we're just getting get confused. So what God does for us is he prepares us. He gives us little bits of advice, little bits of motivation. And we start by learning a little bit, and we continue to grow in that mindset and continue to grow in that faith and continue to grow in that ability to follow the path that he has for us. Well, we may not see it, we may not know it, we may not be able to put it all together, but what God does is shows us little bits at a time. So what we've got to do is prepare. Not clear the path. God's going to clear the path. God's going to make the path. The Holy Spirit's going to guide us on the path. But what we've got to do is prepare ourselves and the ones around us for when Jesus comes back. Remember those promises that God had, that, that, that his people would show the world who he is. All nations would know him by his people. He chose us to do that. We've got to prepare those around us as well. We've got to help others do what God is calling us to do. That's the application for today. Get ready for this journey that is going to be in front of us. We don't know what it is yet, but God's shown you enough through your life to help you prepare for where it is that he wants you to be today. You see how prophecies can be a little bit confusing to study? All these different applications, all these different times, and everybody throughout history has looked at this and said, this applies to me right now. And they've looked at this and says, it must be the end times coming today because this all seems to be happening right now. That's just how good God is. He can write something that applies to all of us, that is applied in a lot of different times in life and still shows us what the future has to hold for us. Let's look at another theme here, another theme in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 54. Again, I'm going to read quite a bit. I'm going to read the whole, uh, whole chapter of 54. I'll pay attention again to those, those questions and think about this as we read through it. How could it apply to the exiles? How could it apply to Jesus' first coming, his second coming, and what can we do with it today? So start in verse 1 of chapter 54. Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Bring forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth. And you will not remember the reproach of your widowhood any more. For the Maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth, for the Lord has called you, like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your Lord. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you. Nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. O you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted, Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems, and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and the walls of your pre with precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you, sh you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it not shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble. But not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the spoiler to destroy. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. So do you catch the imagery here that, that it starts out with, this husband and wife family kind of depiction that, that is carried out in the New Testament. The New Testament talks about the church being Christ's bride. So we see that 
that kind of theme in Scripture at different times. So let's, let's ask our questions, right? Let's go back and see how this applies in the different place. Let's think about the exile. If you're reading this as a person in exile in Babylon, hoping about this promise, what is it that you see and how was it fulfilled? Now, one thing we do know is that it, it never got to the point uh, where, it, where it talks there in 10 and 11, where the city is built with uh, foundations of sapphires and, and gates of crystal. That, that was never achieved after this time. It, it wasn't built that Jerusalem wasn't that beautiful city that was, was built on this. So that, that doesn't apply, right? But, but what did happen? What did happen is that even in that, that time that the God had looked away, God's kindness didn't stop. That even as it seemed like they were suffering and grieving and hurting and laboring, God's promises remained. God's kindness was there. What's he saying in verse 8? For a while, for a moment, I hid my face from you, but my kindness and my mercy remained. God still blessed the nation. God still led the nation. God still had a plan for them, and he delivered them. He kept his promises. So fulfilled, right, by the exile. What God said would happen would happen. All right, what about Jesus' first coming? Well, look, look at verse 8 again. Does it sound familiar that God hides his face when he sees the wrath happening? Right? Remember what happened with Jesus on the cross. God had to look away. What did Jesus say? My God, why have you forsaken me? Right? And verse 7 says, for a mere moment, I have forsaken you. Sound familiar? What about verse 13? Remember when Jesus was, was there, the children were coming up to him. The disciples said, all the children need to go away. This is Jesus. He needs to be teaching the, the people that, that can hear Verse 13 says, all your children shall be taught by the Lord. Jesus welcomed the children in. Jesus wanted to teach the children. He says that we should approach him kind of with that same childlike attitude. Right? So Jesus living in his first comings, fulfilling these Isaiah prophecies as well. That's how God works. right? God's giving us hints about that as well. What about the, the second coming of Jesus? How does that fit in? Now we've We've heard about it, right? We, we, we read this passage. I want to read a passage here from, from Revelation, um, see if it, it fits here as well. Revelation chapter 21 says this, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven say, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Now to me that reads a, a, a lot like we just read here, right? What verse 14 says, there shall be no oppression, there shall be no more fear, there shall be no more terror. Right? All, all these things, right? God talks about this new kingdom being established. We see throughout Revelation that this king is, or this kingdom is, is a beautiful place with, with stones and streets of gold and a sea made of crystal. All, all of this, this greatness described in Revelation talked about first here in Isaiah. Right, so God's giving us this hint what the second coming could mean. What about God's kingdom? What about the kingdom of God, Right? Again, we see those descriptions of what the kingdom of God physically will look like. Like verse 12, pinnacles of rubies, gates of crystal, walls of precious stone. We get hints of exactly what God's kingdom will physically look like. Now the important question, what about today? That's good to know, right? Heaven's going to be there. Heaven's going to look great. Heaven's going to be wonderful. Heaven's going to be a place with no more tears and no more sorrow and no more hurt. But, but today, right? Today, my, my door's still made out of wood. I still hurt and have tears and have sorrow and have pain. So we're not to that place yet. I'm not a, an exile in Babylon with a hope of, of, of getting out. That's not where, where we fit. So what do we fit today? What does it mean today? How can we apply this to our lives today? Well, what we see here is that if God's got that plan that he could talk to the exiles and God could, could make it happen with Jesus' coming and fulfill these prophecies and, and a promise to look forward to the second coming that's consistent with other places in Scripture, what that tells me is that God's got a plan that's bigger than, than we probably understand. 
It also tells me that no matter what happens around us, that God's kindness stays, right? Even though it seems like God may have turned his head, it may seem like God isn't listening, that God isn't paying attention, the scripture here says that no matter what, God's kindness stays. Right? Look at the verse 17, how this, this chapter ends. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is God's promise to us. That yes, we're going to have tongues come against us, and yes, there's going to be weapons that are formed against us. Yes, there's going to be attacks and pain and sorrow and hurt today, but it won't last. Because God's got a plan bigger than this. And if we believe what God said to the exiles that happened is true, and we see that it was, if we believe that, that what Jesus accomplished and fulfilled these prophecies when he came is true and it was, then we've got to believe also that God promises here that whatever it is we're going through, has a purpose bigger than, than maybe we see right here in the middle of it. But in the end, God's promises are, are what overcomes. God is what will make us prosper. And God's kindness will stay with us throughout all of that. So yes, it's good to understand prophecies and see where they go, but what it's really telling us, all these prophecies throughout Scripture, to me, tell us that God's got it under control. That God's got a plan, that God's got a path, and we've got to prepare ourselves to see that when the time comes for it. Now that's two of the, the chunks of passages and different themes throughout here in Isaiah. I'll, I'll throw a couple more out here in case you want to, uh, to go and look. There's a, a similar theme about water in uh, chapter 41, verses 17 through 20. It talks about the Holy Spirit as a theme in chapter 44, verses 1 through 5 talks about all the nations coming together in chapter 60, the year of the Lord in chapter 61. It's kind of the same theme, this, this idea that there's a prophecy, there's some words, there's some guidance, and it applies throughout history, and it can apply to us today. If you want to study further, those are where we go. But keep that in mind, that what God's talking about may apply to the exiles, may apply to Jesus, may apply to us probably to all of the above in some way. So keep that open in your mind always as you read through prophecies, as you try to understand Scripture, see how it can affect us and apply to us today. Prophecies are confusing. Trust me, they're hard to preach on too. It's, but it's here for a reason, right? God put every word in the Scripture there on purpose. So uh, take some time and study through that and meditate on what God is, is leading you to do and where the path that God is taking you today. Anybody have anything this morning before we close? All right, let's sing one more song.